a Christian response to Israeli apartheid. Although the term apartheid emerged in the 20th century, supremacism, uh, segregation, racial prejudice can be traced back to biblical times. And sadly, it was prevalent even among God's people, just as it is now. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, let no foreigner who's bound themselves to the Lord say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who hold fast to my covenant, these I'll bring to my holy mountain, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Now just think about that. Why would foreigners say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people if God tells them not to? Why would foreigners feel excluded because presumably the Lord's people were doing the excluding. They thought they could maintain their holiness or their um, racial purity by not mixing with Gentiles, by forbidding mixed marriages, for example, and by erecting barriers even in the temple. But notice why the Lord forbids this arrogance and prejudice. He says, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. God is saying, this is my house, not your house. I decide who's welcome to my house. Now, these verses are familiar because Jesus uh, quotes them um, in Mark chapter 11, we discover on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, why does Jesus quote from Isaiah 56? Because the temple had become segregated by ethnicity. Solomon's temple was not segregated, but the temple that Herod built had separate areas for Jews and Gentiles, and they were divided by a Hephrada fence, a separation fence. The merchants and the money changers were trading in the court of the Gentiles. This made it difficult, if not impossible, for foreigners to worship the one true God. They'd come all the way to Jerusalem, and yet they were impeded within the temple. And on top of that, the prices for the doves and the lambs for sacrifice or the exchange rates uh, with which they had to purchase temple currency to make their donations were inflated to exploit the gullible foreign pilgrims. But there's more than that. Traditionally, this, uh, this story is called Jesus cleansing the temple. The more I think about it, though, the less I'm convinced. Did his actions change anything? What happened the moment Jesus left the temple? The merchants and the money changers would have cleaned up, put their tables back, and started trading again. No, Jesus wasn't cleansing the temple. He was closing the temple. He was serving the scribes and the Pharisees with their redundancy papers. He was posting a demolition order on the building. How do we know that? Well, when challenged to prove his authority, Jesus answered them, John chapter 2, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. 
the temple was a temporary edifice because the true temple is Jesus. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed within a generation. It was temporary. God had never wanted the temple in the first place. He was content to dwell in the tabernacle. The temple was temporary until the true temple had arrived. Jesus is the true temple of God. We learn more about this from John chapter 4 when Jesus encounters the woman of Samaria. They get into a debate about where worship should take place. Samaritans were not allowed to enter the temple in Jerusalem, so they built their own in Samaria. And so in the debate, it says, Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Notice Jesus says the time has now come. You see, the temple in Jerusalem was temporary until the true temple had arrived. What happened the moment uh, Jesus died on the cross? We're told in Matthew 27, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. God tore that curtain apart. The temple was now redundant. It had served its purpose. Access to a holy God was now possible without a temple, without a high priest, without an animal sacrifice, because Jesus fulfilled the role of the temple of the high priest and the sacrifice when he died in our place, not just for the Jews, but for all nations. And as we read further into the New Testament, we find this image of the temple develops further, because wonder of wonders, a new and living temple is under construction. The Apostle Peter writes, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You see, that last expression, not a people, was a way of describing the Gentiles. They were not members of the chosen people, but in Jesus Christ, they are welcomed in by faith, not race. Now you are, Jews and Gentiles, the people of God. This is the glorious vision of the people of God from all nations united in Jesus Christ. And as we get to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, we see this great number that no one can count of every language, tribe and nation surrounding the throne of God, worshipping the Lamb. This is God's answer to segregationists, to those who think that their uh, purity rests in separating themselves from those of other ethnic groups. This is God's answer to Christian apologists for Zionism today. God opposed apartheid then in scripture. God opposes apartheid now. There's no place for apartheid or ethnic segregation among the people of God, because in his death and uh, in his resurrection, Christ has broken down the Hephrata wall of partition. And that's why at the Sabeel Kairos UK annual conference, we reaffirm that all people are created equal in the image of God. 
That is why we repudiate all forms of racism and discrimination, and we recommit ourselves to work for justice, peace, and reconciliation. Amen.